All right, hope you guys had a great weekend. And I just made a new lecture slides for the second week, posted on the course website. And with this new slide, uh, let me record one or two videos uh, before going to bed, uh, depending on my physical condition. So this is the second video of the second week because uh, it didn't cover functions last week. Uh, but the uh, main topic of the second week is about study analysis. So we now move on to part two and study how to analyze a linear model. Okay. So we discussed the economic model in the previous week. So in each model, variables are interrelated by equations. And what I mean by a linear model, so in a linear model, variables are interrelated by linear equations. Right? But linear equation, you may wonder, it is a special case of general functions. So assuming some you know, interrelationship based on linearity, it may sound a, uh, a little bit restrictive. That is restrictive. Nevertheless, linear model provides rich insights about several economic problems. And as a matter of fact, this model is a little bit more general than you had expected. You're going to see why. Okay. So let me first cover chapter three in the textbook. That is just for motivation. Uh, so it tells us why we study, uh, why we have to study linear models and linear algebra. Okay. So it introduces equilibrium analysis. And let me first give you one minute summary of classic microeconomics. So classic microeconomics is nothing but these three elements, these three building blocks. So it consists of these three building blocks. The first building, building block is consumer theory. So that is a theory behind this demand curve. So why demand curve is downward sloping like this? Okay. And the second, we study producer theory, and that is a theory behind this uh, supply curve. Why it is upward sloping in contrast with demand curve. And the last building block is equilibrium analysis. Yeah? So if you studied uh, any level of economics, you may, you, may, you may have seen equilibrium is determined at the intersection where demand equals supply, okay? So that is a, uh, you know, three building blocks of classic microeconomics, okay? And in our textbook, equilibrium is defined in a very sophisticated way. It's defined as some constellation or something, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I think that is not that, you know, uh, practical definition. Let me just cite a Wikipedia, all right? In Wikipedia, equilibrium is defined as a situation in which several economic forces are balanced off, okay? So they're simply demand equal to supply. And the more important property of equilibrium is the next. In the absence of external forces, values will not change, okay? That's a major property of equilibrium. And if you study principle of microeconomics, uh, you studied that in a comparative market where no one's ever market power to set the price. So price is determined only through competition in a market. Then equilibrium occurs at the intersection where demand is or demand equals supply, uh, as displayed in this figure. All right. Uh, the reason is. If price is above P star, okay, then there will be excess supply, okay. So the firms that means they have some units in stock, some units are produced but not sold out. That evidently incurs a some additional cost to firms. So now firms have an incentive to raise the price and produce less. On the other hand, if P, price is below this P star, then there will be excess demand. So now firms have an incentive to increase 
So produce more and raise the price, right? So in either case, uh, some values will change. So it's not an equilibrium, okay? So the only candidate for equilibrium is uh, this intersection. Okay? So this is equilibrium analysis, but this is just the one part of equilibrium analysis in economics. Actually, traditional economics offers two different angles. The first angle is what we just saw. Uh, that is called the partial equilibrium analysis. So in this analysis, we look at one market law. Okay, just as in the previous slide, we looked at a, a one supply curve. That means a, a one supply that, that shows us uh, at each price what is a quantity supplied for one specific commodity. Okay, and likewise, this demand curve shows uh, the people's demand or uh, the quantity demanded at each price for one specific commodity. That is a, a partial equilibrium analysis. And then we ask uh, if there is any price at which uh, demand and supply are balanced off, so the market is in equilibrium. The second analysis is called the general equilibrium analysis. So literally, this is a little bit more general analysis than uh, the previous one. So now, instead of looking at one market in isolation, we look at all relevant markets, okay? So we look at several markets. And because of several markets, we have several prices, and we ask them uh, if there are prices so that each market is in equilibrium simultaneously, okay? And each methodology has pros and cons. Partial equilibrium analysis provides us with a clean and simple picture of price formation. So we can easily see, as in the previous picture, previous slide, how price is determined in a market. Okay? But it ignores potential feedback effects. So if something changes in one market, it may affect other markets. So it may affect the other markets' prices. That in turn affects the market we are looking at. So there might be some interactions between, you know, some markets. And the partial equilibrium is a, uh, just a, we look at a, a one market isolation, in isolation. It means a, a, we do not take into account such an interaction between markets that may potentially exist, but we ignore them, right? So in case of a high interdependence between several markets, General equilibrium, so looking at all markets simultaneously, is more appropriate, okay? But it also has a drawback. That is, as you can easily anticipate, uh, analysis becomes more intricate, more complicated. So identification of the exact effect might be a very difficult task, all right? So each methodology has a pros and cons. But if markets are highly interrelated, for example, it is very difficult to imagine that economic growth or demographic changes occur as a, a transaction in a single market. You know, it is more likely that several markets are involved. Uh, for international economic relations, we have to take, take into account two countries' markets at the same time, at least, and so for monetary policies. So for the analysis of these issues, uh, general equilibrium analysis is more appropriate. All right. And here is one specific example. Um, so this example concerns movie tickets and video cassette rentals. So I took this example from Google. Uh, so I searched uh, general equilibrium analysis images because I didn't want to draw these two figures because uh, it takes too much time. But as soon as I took this example and uh, put it on the lecture slide, I was a little bit worried about that. If you guys ever heard video cassette, uh, so this video cassette was a. This is a. Uh, so when I was young, when I was a high school student, the only way to watch movie at home was a uh, go to rental shops and to borrow a uh, to rent a videotapes. Okay. 
And when I was a uh, university student, I experienced the transition from uh, videotape to DVD. You may experience a, uh, another transition from DVD to uh, so online platform like a Netflix. So if so, the on um, we have two diagrams here. The first diagram shows demand and supply for uh, movie tickets, and the second shows demand and supply for uh, so video cassette. So if that example does not work for you, you may think of it. You may think of this. You may think of this as demand for Netflix. Uh, if that works, uh, all right. But now the issue is, suppose the government imposes tax on each movie ticket by one dollar. Okay, then you know it really shifts the supply. If that tax was levied on on uh, supply side, then the tax will shift up the supply curve by one. So as a result, equilibrium price will go up. Okay, a very simple, but this is not the end of the story. Because if the price of a movie ticket goes up, some customers will, trend, uh, will, will make a transition from the uh, movie theater. So originally they wanted to watch movies at movie theaters, but now that becomes more expensive. So instead they just wanna, you know, uh, they just wanna subscribe Netflix and enjoy movies at home meaning that demand for net netflix will go up okay and that affects you know the demand for movie ticket so we can anticipate the demand for movie ticket will go down so it will reduce the price so that reduces all the equilibrium price again okay so this is the story of a general equilibrium uh, we can't take these two markets separately because we can we can expect some high interdependence uh, between movie ticket market and Netflix market, right? So if we uh, if we want to see some effect of tax on price for movie ticket, we have to consider uh, these two markets at the same time, all right? Uh, let me go back to partial equilibrium and uh, to see how we analyze equilibrium in a very simple model. So this is a linear model, okay? But in partial equilibrium, because we just look at one market or one commodity, so the only variables we need are these three. So quantity demanded denoted by Q sub D and quantity supplied for the commodity denoted by Q sub S, and the price, denoted by P, okay? And there is a linear relation, a linear relationship between uh, variables. So the demand curve is given by this linear equation, A minus BP. Supply is given by uh, another linear uh, equation, another linear equation, negative C plus DP, okay? And because the uh, demand is downward sloping, supply is upward sloping, so we can see uh, here two uh, parameters, uh, B and D, uh, are positive constants, right? And the, uh, as I told you, in case of perfect competition, equilibrium is determined at the intersection point where uh, demand equals supply, so the, from this equilibrium condition, we can easily identify uh, the coordinate of this intersection point. So uh, A minus BP, we set demand equal to supply, negative C plus DP. And this is a linear equation with respect to P. So we collect uh, P terms and put them on the right side so BP plus DP on the right and the remaining terms on the left and factor out P and dividing both sides by B plus D then we obtain 
a plus c over b plus d, right? So that is a, because uh, we put price on the horizontal axis, so that this is a x coordinate of this intersection. And then substituting this expression for p uh, in the uh, in, in either demand function or supply function, you can easily identify the corresponding y coordinate. But that is just the algebraic works. Very simple, you know. This is not a math; it's just a arithmetic. And I'm not sure if you guys read the uh, newspaper article, Wall Street Journal article I posted on the course website. Uh, you know, nowadays such a skill, you know, the computational skill has no values, uh, no economic values, because uh, everybody has personal computer or smartphone, and computer does uh, this kind of job much faster and more precisely. So, you know, uh, what you have to improve by taking math course at universities is not this computational skill, but, you know, uh, to strengthen your your reasoning uh, or you know make your argument more logical uh, or you know finding new algorithms okay that will be paid off but the uh, computation skill you know uh, I think a uh, yeah we don't have to improve that skill anymore okay so I'm not gonna focus on this kind of you know boring or you know mechanical some you know mechanic engineering stuffs. Uh, instead, uh, I want to introduce a, a more you know some mathematical reasoning or economic reasoning. Okay, and I want to test on such ability in the exam as well. So now moving to nonlinear model. Still we have a uh, we still are uh, in the partial equilibrium analysis world. Now the uh, we have demand function given by uh, quadratic function, okay, and supply function is still linear, okay, and the way to find the intersection is the same as before, okay, so uh, here now we have 4 minus p squared uh, equal to 4p minus 1, this is a uh, uh, supply and this is a uh, demand, quantity demanded, q sub d. Then still we apply uh, the same equilibrium condition. Now we come up with a quadratic equation that can be solved by quadratic formula, right? So, but for this, uh, if we rearrange the terms, then p squared plus 4p uh, minus 5 equal to 0, okay? So we first convert it into, convert it into standard form then now it is factorable, uh, fortunately. So p plus p my oh, so p plus five times p minus one. Yeah. So p is either one or negative five, but you know negative price has no economic meaning. So we learned it out. And then we, we can conclude uh, the equilibrium price is equal to 1 and it's substituting back into uh, either demand or supply or we can easily identify equilibrium quantity that is a 3. And that is a partial equilibrium. So it's to find the intersection. That is the only task we have to do. Now we're going to general equilibrium. So uh, we begin with a simple linear model in which two commodities are interrelated. Okay, so the, we now have two markets. So the, the expression on the left describes demand for commodity one and supply. And the expressions on the right are demand and supply for uh, commodity two. Okay, so here is what we have a, here we have a one specific example. So the demand for commodity 1 is given by 10 minus 2p1 plus p2. Still in your equation, uh, but you know, two variables are involved now. Uh, so because the coefficient of p2 is positive, meaning that 
uh, these two commodities are substitutes. So as P2 goes up, the price of the other commodity goes up, the demand for that commodity uh, will go up as well. Okay? And similarly, demand for commodity 2 has a negative sign for P2, the, the price for itself, but the price for the other good, it has a, uh, a positive sign. So uh, we can verify that two commodities are uh, substitutes. Okay, but the supply is a function of one variable. So the supply for commodity 1 is a function of P1. And supply for commodity 2 is a function of linear function of P2. Okay. And what are the uh, prices at which these two markets are, are in equilibrium at the same time? Then we apply the you know, equilibrium conditions. So now we have to set demand for commodity 1 equal to supply. And at the same time, uh, demand for commodity 2 equal to supply. Okay. So, uh, what we have? From the first condition, we have a uh, 10 minus 2p1 plus p2 equals minus 2 plus 3p1. So, rearranging this, 5p1 minus p2 equals 12, right? I just move this 2p1 term to the right and p2 as well. And then I collect the constant terms on the, on the left. Okay, so 10 plus 2 becomes 12. And similarly, you can just set these two equal to each other. And then rearranging like this gives us these two uh, linear equations. In other words, system of linear equations. And there are three ways of solving this kind of systems. The first one is a substitution. So this means that from the second equation, we know P1 is negative 16 plus 3P2. Then we can substitute this expression uh, for P1 in the first, say 5 times negative 16 plus 3P2 minus P2 equals 12. So it is, this substitution is uh, one linear equation with respect to one variable. So now there is only one variable, so we can solve for P2, right? And from that, we can find the P1. That is a substitution method. And elimination of variables, that is a second method. Uh, this means, because, uh, all right, if we multiply five, uh, both sides in the second, then the uh, equation becomes 5p1 minus 15p2. The right side becomes negative 16 times 5, so negative 80, right? Okay, so now if we subtract the second from the first, Okay, so now we uh, subtract away uh, the expression on the bottom from the one on the top. Then this 5p1 will be eliminated, right? So now we are left with uh, negative 14p2 on the left and on the right, negative 92. So from this, we can find the value of p2. 92 over 14, okay? Then once again, we can substitute for P2 here to find the corresponding P1. That's the elimination of variables, okay? And then another way is matrix methods. Uh, we are going to study from, from now on, okay, for I think two weeks. Uh, so the first two methods are very useful uh, in case of few variables, so just like this example, uh, two variables or three variables, we can uh, we can solve the system of linear equations uh, either uh, by substitution or elimination. But 
in case of many variables, say 10 variables or you know, 20, 30, oh, in that case, you know, substitution and elimination, met elimination method, rather than these two, matrix algebra, matrix methods provide a much more practical way of finding a solution. Okay? So this is why we study this matrix algebra from now on. There are two more reasons. So linear algebra applied to two other instances uh, in economics. First is econometrics. So econometrics is the course of uh, you know, how to handle economic data. Mm -hmm. So if you take this course, you're going to learn uh, several methodologies of a, uh, how to analyze a, uh, economic data. So linear algebra is a key tool to uh, studying that subject. It's, it, it, it comes as no surprise because the economic data can be put as some metrics, right? So the basic econometric theory, uh, if you understand that, so in order to understand basic econometric theory, you need this linear algebraic skills. So that is important. The second, you know, this linear algebra shows up in our course again. So when we study optimization theory in the future, in the last part, uh, this uh, linear algebra shows up again. So that's why we're going to study linear algebra from now on. All right? Just for motivation. Uh, I think I talked too much. And let me stop video here. And then I'm going to talk about linear algebra uh, in the next video. Hopefully you enjoy this video and see you in the next.